I'll never forget the day I had to shred GED exams for a living. It's not exactly what I pictured after earning my PhD and responding to God's call into the ministry. But looking back, it serves as a reminder that sometimes God has to strip us down before he builds us back up. That was 2004. My wife and I sensed a call from God to move to Atlanta from California. I had never stepped foot in Atlanta, but everywhere we went, we kept hearing Atlanta, move to Atlanta. And while we heard Atlanta, God also kept impressing upon us a particular passage of scripture. It was Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2. It was telling us to get out of our country, from our family and from our father's house, to a land that he would show us. He said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. So we went. I heard a definition last week about the term faith. It was from Jeff Smith of the Tutu Collective, and he said, faith is hearing from God, believing what he said, and acting upon what he said. Let me say that again. Faith is hearing from God, believing what he said, and acting on what he said. And having felt we heard clearly from God in his word, we packed up our lives, I quit my job, we sold our house, and we moved to Georgia. Doris was already training in Atlanta for track and field, and when I pulled up to Douglasville in my tan minivan, I took the keys at closing and we walked in our new house that Doris had picked out and I had never seen. Now that 2,000 mile drive from California to Georgia was grueling, especially through Texas. Just when you thought you were nearing the end of driving through Texas, there was another sign that would pop up saying 400 miles to Baton Rouge. I completed the trip in less than 35 hours because my friend Freddie, driving his own car, refused to stop for rest unless I begged him. At one point, I thought I was hallucinating in Texas, struggling to keep my eyes on the road. Now, since that day, the journey of faith and surrender to God's will these past 20 years has often felt like that drive through Texas. When will we get through this? It fits perfectly for my journey once I surrender to Jesus Christ. When will the promises of Genesis 12 2 come to pass? When will the great nation, the great name, the great blessing come to pass? Can anybody relate? I was convinced I was going to become the pastor of one of the largest multi-ethnic congregations in the world. I really did. But God's plan, and perhaps his sense of humor, was that I would pastor a close-knit family of about 25, including children, impacting the world for Jesus Christ. I have never been more certain of a verse in my life that we make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. I see much of my journey in the story of Joseph there in Genesis chapter 37 through 50. Just like Joseph, I had a dream. He saw a vision suggesting that one day his father, mother, and brothers would bow down to him. His dream sparked jealousy among his brothers, and I suspect his father's favoritism may have caused some pride that needed to be dealt with. Before fulfilling his destiny, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, and falsely imprisoned before going to the palace. God used these trials to prepare him for great responsibility, teaching him patience, wisdom, and reliance on him alone. For an entire year after arriving in Atlanta, I applied for numerous jobs that I was well qualified for, but I couldn't get so much as a rejection letter, let alone an interview. At one point, we were down to 59 cents in our bank account, and no, this wasn't the time that I gambled all of our, our, our money away. That day, I was preaching with 59 cents in my bank account, telling people who were experiencing homelessness, addiction, and prostitution that my God shall supply 
all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I was preaching to myself. If they weren't hearing it, that was something I needed to hear. Well, within a few days, a friend offered me a job as a GED proctor. But instead of proctoring the exams, I found myself shredding thousands of old tests with a small paper shredder. I couldn't believe that this was where I ended up. They started me with one of those fellows paper shredders like you might have in your home. You know, the ones that can handle about five to seven sheets at a time. Any more than the paper, jam, the paper would jam, right? You'd need to get a, 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 some scissors and a screwdriver to get that paper out. And some of you know the other problem. If you're, if you're shredding boxes and boxes and boxes of pieces of paper, what happens to that little fellow's paper shredder besides jamming? It overheats. So you got to let it cool for 20 minutes. And I'm looking my first day on the job at thousands of these exams in boxes. I got a fellow's paper shredder that's jamming. I got a screwdriver in my pocket. It's overheating. And in one day, I shredded one box of exams and filled one glad trash bag. I'm telling you right now, at this rate, it was going to take months. And this was certainly far from the prestigious position or ministry opportunity I had hoped for. But the next day, my employer and my friend Peter Gaddis brought in this massive industrial-sized paper shredder that could handle 20 to 30 sheets at a time. And with tears in my eyes, I was feeling good when I was taking 20 sheets with both hands, throwing them in the shredder, filled up 10, 20 bags in one day. I was grateful, but I was humbled. And with tears in my eyes, I just thank God that he was giving me a job. But also, I knew in my heart he was trying to do something that day to prepare me for something greater. Looking back, it was clear that God was shaping my purpose even during my childhood. I developed a strong work ethic, starting with my first job as a paper boy at just 10 years old. I worked seven days a week, including holidays, rain or shine, carrying newspapers six miles daily, and weighing well over 80 pounds on Sundays because of all the advertisements. The job taught me valuable skills like marketing, finance, customer relations, production, distribution, and time management. And I'm proud to say that I was one of seven finalists for Carrier of the Year among 100 paper carriers. And though I didn't win, being a finalist resulted in a half-page article with my picture in the newspaper. A year or so getting, after getting mugged on my route, which I talked about three weeks ago, I went on to be a fresh-squeezed orange juice wholesaler. A squeezing juice in bulk and selling it at the Stanford football game in scorching heat, which gave me a great respect and appreciation for sporting event vendors. I went on from there to work at a one-hour photo lab for several years, handling film development and printing. I mixed toxic chemicals, processed negatives, and sorted photos, all while dealing with the extremely picky customer sometimes, a trait that I must admit I've inherited as well. What I've described so far relates to Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 37, verse 2. It reads, this is the history of Jacob. Don't miss that. It's talking about Joseph's story, and it opens with, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. We don't hear much about those early years, but we do know that Joseph was a shepherd. But what's interesting to me is that the story of Joseph starts with mentioning his father. And I want to say to young people, don't ever forget that your legacy goes back generations for you and your family, and you got to represent. I imagine Joseph learned a lot as a shepherd. Likewise, my experience with early jobs taught me critical skills that would lay the foundation for my future. The task may have seemed small or routine, but they were developing character discipline, and responsibility. I didn't know it at the time, but like Joseph, God was preparing me for something I never expected. 
And as I reflect on my experiences with prejudice, bipolar disorder, and addiction, along with those early jobs, I see how all of it contributed to my current role as a pastor. I can relate to some of Joseph's mistreatment as well, but certainly not at the same level. At age 26, while I was working for a social justice organization, I faced a setback when I started to share my brand new faith in Christ. The organization was concerned that I was talking too much about God, so they removed me from this role that I had been serving in for years. And that wasn't an isolated incident. I was also placed on probation at another job at Cal Poly due to an accusation of homophobia, despite never having discussed my newfound religious beliefs and how they related to LGBTQ issues. Frankly, I believe at the end of the day that it was my faith in Jesus Christ that was a source of discomfort and hostility that I would face throughout my work doing social justice. I found myself being labeled as intolerant for holding biblical values. And although the work that I did was driven by equity and inclusion, sincere Christians who followed Jesus simply weren't included in that worldview. Despite the setbacks, God opened up another door with the Anti-Defamation League, a Jewish organization I worked with and continue to this day for 28 years. The purpose of the organization is to advocate for justice, fair treatment, and compassion for all people. From being a terrified public speaker, which I'll do a whole message on in a few weeks, I went on to training thousands of people in education and now law enforcement as well. When Joseph was thrown in prison, God opened a door for him to lead there. And my work has taught me that when one door closes, even unjustly, God opens another. And each step, no matter how difficult, continues and contributes to his greater plan. Joseph's time as a slave managing Potiphar's household and leading in a prison prepared him to later manage an entire nation's resources in a severe famine. He served faithfully even though he didn't deserve to be in either of those places. And just like Joseph, God uses our past painful experiences to prepare us for the future he has destined for us. Without the pit, Potiphar's and the prison, there would have been no palace. I say it often, but who you are today was not formed on the mountaintop, it was forged in the fire. Every job, every job loss, every hardship, every painful lesson was not wasted. Hear me with this, there is a redemptive purpose in everything that you and I go through. In discovering our purpose, I see not only preparation and persecution, but I also see God's providence. One pivotal moment came during my freshman year of college when a resident advisor told me he saw on me the potential to be a leader. Inspired by his encouragement, I became a resident advisor and embarked upon a 12-year career in college student affairs. I began as an RA, quickly advanced to assistant residence life coordinator, and eventually became an area coordinator. That role had some great perks, free housing, free meals, leadership development, and a master's degree that was fully paid for. I also supervised both student and professional staff and served in a variety of unusual roles at the Office of Student Life and Cultural Centers. I had some unique opportunities such as advising the construction of the Cal Poly Rose Float, which was put in the Tournament of Roses Parade and seen by millions on New Year's Day every single year. I also coordinated events that gave me the opportunity to meet and work with Magic Johnson, Spike Lee, Gwen Stefani, uh, Black Eyed Peas, a lot of others that were exciting as well. I felt like I had achieved my dream, go dream job. One of the most profound experiences in higher education for me gave me the ability to start moving forward when God would prompt my heart to do something big. 
He prompted me to create an academic degree in multicultural leadership studies. It was a minor. I heard from God. I believed what he said. And I stepped out with no clue how I was going to get it done. So you need to understand, I had no formal academic program development training. I wasn't faculty. I wasn't a vice president. I was just some little guy in a department that felt the call from God to help get this curriculum established. Well, it took a year to get done, but the minor continues to help students today develop cultural competencies and leadership skills. During the same time, I completed a master's degree in counseling and a PhD in education, all while maintaining a 4.0 GPA and working full time. I looked up in the in the attic, I looked up in the balcony on that one. Now let's change gears a little bit. I'm going now to Atlanta, two years after moving to Atlanta in 2006. Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans, displacing thousands of people who fled to Atlanta. It kind of reminds me of the famine in Egypt, just as Joseph was being prepared to leave. Well, by God's providence, I was a member of that church at the time, and they had raised over $250,000 in one Sunday that they used to help people who were in need. I was hired as a full-time consultant to coordinate the emergency response. My role involved arranging temporary housing and shelters, helping them get medical care, and also getting them through the red tape of FEMA benefits. It was pivotal in my future role of pastoring, helping me to serve people who were suffering. When this role ended, I transitioned to serving as the membership director at the church. When I became a member and was serving in that role, we had 2,500 members. And there were two services on a Sunday. By the time I left, it had grown to over 10,000 members with four campuses and 13 services. My responsibilities included helping members integrate into the life of the church, leading the men's ministry, and Ray was a part of that, Minister Phil, preaching at various campuses, and managing a team of two staff members and over 80 volunteers. Now, my greatest joy came from preaching. I like to preach, but I also like to guide people into a personal relationship with Jesus. And I like supporting their spiritual growth as well. Well, after seven years, I sensed that God was preparing me for a new direction. And after transitioning from that church, I was faced with a lot of uncertainty. I quickly applied for positions nationwide leading a discipleship while I was leading a discipleship group of three families in my home. We were debating between whether we should take one of these two job offers that I received during that time that would pay me more than I had ever made up to that point in my career or stay with the three families and plant a church. Well, we felt God was leading again and by faith we chose to stay and plant the church. A few months later, I was invited to preach and ultimately accepted the role of lead pastor at Perimeter Point Church in Sandy Springs. It was a young church plant with 12 people. This position became the most challenging I had ever experienced. The early days were so tough, and some of the latter years as well. (laughs) Nearly all the founding members left within six months. I was inexperienced and I pushed too hard trying to grow the church without shepherding the people effectively that were already there. We faced further challenges as we grew to about 40 or 50 people in attendance on Sundays when I was called by the Southern Baptist Association and they threatened to pull my funding because I had allowed a woman to preach. I have since reconciled that issue and would put a woman up if God leads me to, to preach to you on Sunday mornings. But for a moment there, I was studying doctrine and struggling on what my theological view was going to ultimately be. And I eventually decided that we were going to move forward. But when it happened, in fear, I put a pause on having women preach. That resulted in... You guessed it, a woman or two speaking out about that, and ultimately the church split, and we were back down to about 12 people. 
Well, without going into details, that experience, other experiences throughout Perimeter Point, and even in my church previously to that, a lot of things happened that resulted in church hurt. Some of it even required therapy. Church hurts can be devastating and lead people to leave the church permanently. It's especially damaging and painful, not only because of the spiritual bonds that are severed, but because of the way it negatively reflects upon the body of Christ. This issue is of great concern to Jesus, as evidenced by what he wrote in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep with no shepherd. The verse illustrates Jesus' deep concern for those who leave the church due to hurt or mistreatment. He empathizes with their pain and their desires for healing and restoration. And I must say, as a pastor, I've had to admit to people over the years my mistakes in the way that I handled situations either by my poor leadership decisions or responding to them in a moment of frustration and anger. Despite all the growing pains that we had as a church, we pressed through and have seen significant spiritual growth in nine years. We've seen 106 people come to Christ. We've baptized dozens. We personally prayed for thousands. We've taught a job development course for women in a treatment program. We fed and clothed hundreds. We funded missionaries and preached the gospel in Africa and several other countries. And yet, the church remains small. But it's a dedicated group of people committed to serving an extraordinary God. You might be questioning your own purpose. You may have faced setbacks and delays in pursuing your God-given dream. Well, here are some lessons that I've learned in the journey. Number one. Embrace humility. Like Joseph serving in Potiphar's house in the prison, or in the prison, I should say, you must be willing to serve in small, seemingly insignificant roles. God uses those moments to develop your character. I can remember when I was sent over to one of the new campuses at our former church in Douglasville, where I would eventually go on and preach dozens of times. My first assignment was to pick up a broom and sweep out the storage closet. And when I first arrived at the church with 2,500 people, my first assignment was not preaching to thousands and flying around in a helicopter from one campus to another. It was joining a prayer team of 10 people that prayed back in the chapel during service. Number two, stay faithful in trials. Joseph remained faithful despite betrayal, slavery, and imprisonment. And similarly, perseverance in difficult seasons shape your leadership as well. I've discovered that if you are doing the will of God, there will be naysayers, negativity, and people coming and going out of your life all the time. And to be honest, as a pastor, that hurts. You pour into people, you disciple them, and more often than not, people just leave without giving a reason. My wife reminds me constantly, though, that we must lead with an open hand. God is the one who all of us will have to answer to. Number three, trust God's timing. Joseph's dream took years to be fulfilled. And likewise, discovering your purpose and seeing it come to pass takes time. Trust that God is preparing you even when progress seems slow. Since surrendering to the call of God on my life, he is the one who has opened every single door. I didn't have to go looking for things. I didn't have to try to pry a door open. I just had to stay faithful. And when he felt I was ready for the next assignment, he opened the door. I can remember a time when I visited my previous church before I became a member. My former pastor from a mega church in California was preaching a revival there. When he came out on the stage, he didn't know that we were there. In fact, I didn't even know if he remembered my name. It was a big church. But almost immediately when he walked out on the stage, he introduced my wife and I by name, had us stand up and meet the next congregation that we would become members of for nine years. 
I knew right then it was a Joseph moment where I was moving into a new season of greater responsibility in what was a Joseph elevation in God's providence. Number four, stay close to God and keep a good attitude. Joseph consistently relied on God for wisdom and guidance. See Genesis 41 and 16. And regardless of what came his way, he never complained. Not once in 13 chapters of the Bible. He must have had a close relationship with God. And no matter what came his way, I believe that it was the clear picture of the dream that he had to fulfill that kept him from being rattled. I've got a few more things I want to share with you that I've learned over 20 years. I hope you find it helpful so far. Number five is seek God's guidance in everything. If you haven't already, ask God, young people, to reveal your purpose. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And he also says in James that if we ask for wisdom, he will give us the direction clearly and liberally. Only don't be surprised if he answers with something uncomfortable or unfamiliar for you to do next. I can remember again at the church I formerly was a member of. The place was packed to capacity and my wife and me were sitting near the back. Again, I wasn't a member yet. I had not even met the pastor at that point. Yet during the opening of the conference, while I was just worshiping with my eyes closed and we were sitting near the back, my hands were raised. But when I opened my eyes, the pastor was staring it in the back near my wife and I. Now, I certainly thought that uh, he was probably looking at someone else, but suddenly he started motioning in our direction to come forward. And of course, I just kind of avoided it at first, but then he, I said, and he said, yes, he shook his head. Now, I could have gotten shy and walked out of that place, but eventually I was on the stage and I was opening the conference in a prayer in front of 1,800 people. That pastor didn't know me from Adam. I knew it was God. And if you seek God's guidance and surrender your life to him daily, you'll be amazed at what he does through you. Number six, embrace small beginnings. <laughs> Don't despise humble beginnings, Zechariah 4.10 says. Like Joseph, you've got to accept the small roles and tasks God places in front of you, knowing that they're a part of your preparation. I've had to learn to embrace this concept of small beginnings for quite a while. But you need to embrace where you are and humbly do whatever is in front of you. Bloom where you're planted. It's just the way that it works. Until you are faithful over a few things, you can't expect God to entrust you with more. Do you spend your time doing what God wants you to be doing? Are you generous with what God has given you to support his kingdom work? Are you using your gifts as led by the Spirit with pure motives? Do you support others who are doing what you believe God is calling you to do one day? Well, if you're doing all that, then you're on the right track for elevation. As you continue to trust God and thank him in the journey, he will continue to move you into places and opportunities that were providentially set by God. And let me just add this one thing. I'm a firm believer that fulfilling our purpose isn't just about achieving the goal or reaching a certain status or some final destination. It's about the journey and how God makes you more like his son and you fall deeper in love with God. Number seven, develop your skills. Joseph excelled in administration, leadership, and interpretation of dreams. Use your current season to develop the skills you need for the next step in your journey. What do you need to be working on right now to put you in a position for that next promotion, relationship, or opportunity? How are you honing your craft? What are you reading and learning in line with God's vision and your sense of where he's taking you? Number eight, remain faithful. Stay committed to God and his timing. 
1 Corinthians 15, 58 encourages us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain. I've heard it many times, and it's not always easy to accept, but God is more concerned with your faithfulness than he is your success. This has been a tough lesson for me to learn, but at this stage of my life, it is the primary goal that I strive for in achieving my purpose. Number 10, surround yourself with godly counsel. Proverbs 15, 22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Seek out mentors who can help you stay on track with God's calling. Submit to their leadership and be willing to learn. As I close, just like Joseph, God uses every step of our journey, Josh. Whether we're shredding papers or leading a congregation, he's preparing us for our purpose that he has designed us for. I encourage you to stay faithful in every season, knowing that God is always at work behind the scenes to fulfill his plans for your life. Who am I talking to this morning? You've heard this message, and it spoke directly to your heart. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would continue to help you in the vision, purpose, plan, and destiny that he has for your life. Some of you have strayed from that path. That's okay. His love endures forever. Some of you are sensing right now that he wants you to go deeper in your walk with him. I'm telling you, one baby step in the Lord is met by a thousand steps of grace and faithfulness from our God. So as I pray, and as you hear the Spirit prompting you, there's something about a step of faith. There's something about when we make a determination to put our feet on the ground and start working, walking forward toward our destiny. And if that's you, as I pray, I'm going to invite you to come forward. Maybe it's time for you to surrender to Christ. You've been doing everything your own way. How's that working out for you? Maybe you feel like you've just been on a treadmill going nowhere with your purpose. And I get it if you're beating yourself up right now. You think you're a failure. You think you're a mess. You think you can't get it together. The devil is a liar. I'm here to tell you today, if he can deal with someone who was addicted to alcohol and gambling on the stock market, if he can grab hold of somebody who faced bipolar depression, if he can deal with somebody who's been rejected and mistreated, misunderstood, walked out on, I don't care what you come up with. You can make every excuse in the book, but I'm here to tell you, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Don't miss out on the opportunity to take a step of faith. Remember what I said. Faith is when you hear clearly from God. When you believe what he says, and when you act on what he says. I've just given you my testimony, and I've given you the word of God, and you believe it. You've heard the word of God. You believe the word of God that it was just for you. But faith is not just hearing the word and believing the word, it's acting on what the word says. So again, as I pray, come forward if there's a decision that you need to make for Christ in every level, whatever it is. I was watching online, the church that meets previously to us. The guest pastor, at the end of the service, brought chills to me, brought tears. He said, some of you need to get right with God. You know what happened with that 50 or 60 people? I saw old, I saw teenagers, I saw young adults, I saw families, and this altar was packed with 20 or 30 people. About half of the congregation came forward. I don't know if he wants to deal with sin 
I don't know if he wants to deal with your purpose. I don't know if he wants you to step out and get more serious about Christ. But somebody needs to get right with God. So I invite you to come as I pray this prayer. And all I'm going to do is come up and agree with you that what you stepped out on faith on, God is getting ready to move today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and anticipation for the journey ahead. We thank you for your constant guidance for the lessons you teach us through every challenge and triumph. As we reflect on the journey of faith and purpose, we seek your wisdom and strength. And Lord, we pray for a heart that is tender to your authority and your guidance. Help us to submit fully to your will, embracing Jesus as our Lord in every aspect of our lives. Grant us a life of faith, one that listens attentively to your voice and acts boldly on your promises. We ask for the grace to abide in Christ daily, remaining connected to his life-giving power. Let our lives bear fruit through a deep abiding relationship with you. Teach us to serve with humility, stay faithful in trials, and trust your perfect timing, knowing that you are preparing us for our purpose even when progress looks slow. Lord, guide us to seek your guidance and be open to your promptings. Help us embrace small beginnings, develop the skills needed for the next steps in the journey. Surround us with godly counsel and remind us that our labor is not in vain when we work diligently for your kingdom. May we find joy and fulfillment, not in numbers or success, but in faithful service and growing closer to you. Let us see the impact of our lives and ministries, not only in the visible results, but in the quiet, faithful steps we take each day. We trust that you are always working behind the scenes, fulfilling your plans for our lives. And we ask you to empower us to walk in faith, compelled by your love, and filled with the Holy Spirit. We commit our ways to you, and we seek to honor you in all that we do. And we ask all these things in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ. Let the church say, Amen.